And I think we'll start off just with the, the, first, uh, the first question. So, panel, uh, in your opinion, what are the most important trends in AI currently? And how can students, specifically master students, prepare, at, prepare to be at the cutting edge of these developments? So I'll open that question up to the panel and get uh, those who are interested or three of you to comment on this question, give your answer to this question. Anyone else want to start? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so like um, the most trend, trending uptake of NLP is definitely from engineering. Just in case, guess it be like ChatGPT is been working like really fine. And even we can give in like a how like a very detailed prompt and you can perform exactly the same way. And if you modify it a little bit, you can transfer it into another kind of style of responses, which is very good. But like one thing is I tried a lot of like ChatGPT stuff and I found some of the fact checks issue inside there is provide some kind of hallucination when you just keep forcing it, forcing it, forcing it, we like generate the, the response that is too detailed. It may not provide a very good way to do it. So, I mean, one thing we can prepare for it is like, we can sort of keep doing this prompt engineering to design like sort of a fact check related prompt to make sure it can, it won't go to a, another way that we don't want it to be. So, yeah, I mean, this kind of uh, research can be, can, can be last long a while and and eventually we'll get into a, a, a place that all the models they are doing is keep prompting and prompting and they will have the ability to be trained on a very, very large scale of the data. So that's what I think that we should do right now. And yeah, and, and we can also like perform any kind of downstream distillation on this large language model, even when we, uh, when we give in like a very accurate prompt that we can work on. So yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, does anyone else have thoughts uh, on, on that or the question? Yeah, like I think there are there is a lot of need to understand um how to make these models more usable, more beneficial, more safe for use. And I think that is something that uh, with more and more perspectives coming in, it's usable and so uh, I think that's a very big opportunity that is out there today. There is also a push for including more and more languages into the scope. So there are so many great efforts currently with multi tongue or sub-Saharan African languages or Indic NLP for Indian languages and so on. There's this burst going on of like having great inclusive NLP efforts where more and more languages are being brought into the world. And I think that's another great opportunity to, to capitalize on for fields. And just to add on that, so uh, I think uh, uh, emerging trend that we see these days is that you know, these gigantic models that train on web data um, is, can provide, you know, uh, can capture the world knowledge and can perform on even tasks, right? So think about the research that maybe 10 years ago, we had LP, different models for different tasks, right? So we have, you know, classification models, sending classifications, we have, you know, small tagging models for semantic parsing, part of speed tagging, and we have other models for translation and other things. But today, everything, you know, converged to a single large language model on everything. Uh, and we also see the similar trends in um, different domains. So for example, uh, speech, NLP, and computer vision, they were being treated very separately previously. So for example, computer vision, see it dominates, uh, speech, you know, you know Steve Swallow and others. And with the invention of transformers and wide application of transformers in these days, and we see these different fields are also bringing them closer together. Transformers everywhere become the default model for all of these different intelligence. Um, so I think this is definitely uh, an exciting trend uh, that we see today, where a gigantic model could not huge data to compute can perform this level of intelligence that is towards uh, artificial general intelligence. That is something that is exciting. Um, just to add to 
Uh, yeah, just to add to like the um, large language model formation, uh, in natural language generation, a lot of it is like, how do you control like style? How do you control like the information that it's generating, pre preventing like hallucinations and having consistent information? And I think for where we are right now, that's still a challenge. Um, and there's different methods to try to solve these problems like changing the prompt style, um, instruction tuning, um, referencing databases with knowledge that is factual and then using that in your prompt, um, like part of like grounded generation. Um, you know, I think that's probably a really important area that's like continually kind of evolving. So yeah, but that's what I would say is like an area or a trend that definitely deserves a lot of attention and is very important. So is anyone interested in commenting how our students can prepare to work on these areas specifically? Yeah, if I can jump in, I want to say to all the master students that they live in one of the most amazing times. Um, you have tons of data available, a lot of algorithmic advances and compute across all the different clouds, which make the whole AI generation that we're living in um, a reality. Um, and sometimes, yes, uh, folks that sit in NLP for very long, we get uh, excitement in how do we build and train these models, but the problems is barely solved. Right now we build generic machines that are really good at think about it learning everything about the world but when you start probing them deep they actually don't have understanding they can't help you um, truly with um, let's say a medical uh, problem and that's one of the exciting places where um, how are you going to do then allow anyone to customize and train these models the costs are insane like maybe two million lower to train some model that is going to i don't know to chat with you um, and very quickly to derail right so one of the questions that you can ask yourself is like, how can we build these models to be much more efficient, both in terms of performance, how are we going to serve them, as well as in training? Because not everyone has $2 million or even more to sit down and train such models, right? You're the future engineers, and one of the things that you're going to uh, think about is like, well, how are we going to uh, move out of even prompt engineering, which is a very kind of basic way of how we interact with these um, AI systems into the next level of, um, of communication, right? How are we going to make those models much more efficient? How are we going to serve them? They don't fit in a single GPU. Um, and I think the problem is uh, just starting, right? We're like barely scratching the, the surface. Um, and it's true, if that's the direction that you want to pursue, it's going to become hard you as a student to start preparing for these projects right because you need the compute and maybe you don't have the resources but the best way i believe is to go and volunteer to do projects right or go and there's a lot of open source communities that you can join um, and you can volunteer and help build those models there or you can even do an internship um, or any of those things because one is like learn the foundation which is like what you're doing in the classes do your homeworks um, prep your projects but the next thing that we're also looking for is, um, have you ever been on some project in another team? Have you learned from other folks? And I think that's like the best way to prepare by doing and learning from other folks who've done that before. So we might jump over to another question from our master students. So this is the, the second question from our NLP master students. What essential and technical skill best help students stand out? applying for job and internships in the competitive AI industry. So I heard open source projects and get involved with them as uh, one thing that came up in, the, in my last panelist. What do other panelists think? Um, I, I, I could say from my experience, I would say like specialization, right? So like, okay, we're in NLP all together, but um, within NLP, there's so many spaces and so many like emerging research areas. And I think if you pick one and you master it really well, I think um, people and employers and everyone will like appreciate that. And the ones who will, will tend to be really interested in your background. And in those cases, um, it's good. 
Um, so definitely like pick some area of research that you like really find interesting and like master it, right? And that in that way, like people who are also in that area will appreciate it and uh, pick up on that. <clears throat> um, I think this is all related with the answer to the previous question. Um, you know, now everybody is, is getting excited about ChatGPT, right? It like, feels like ChatGPT is the only thing that it can do in AI. For people who, as old as me, I'm constantly are debating if this is the hype or this is the trend. If you think about three years ago, I also gave a similar panel discussion, and by that time, everybody was talking about it again. Probably haven't even heard about it anymore now. By that time, there's really this thing that everybody in AI is talking about. It's called Generative adversary network, right? It's like a, that's the thing everybody has to work on it. So my advice or my reflection as the NLP practitioner over the past two decades or three decades is understanding what is the core and understanding what the trend is moving. There will be hypes like this every now and then, every four or five years. It does change the trend. For example, if you think about how LGBT, all this hype, all this excitement is changing our industry, our world is, is actually moving up the bar for what human intelligence should be working on. Now, if you think about the content writing or content creation, all this boring, you know, writing a list or writing a thank you note can now be done by AI pretty beautifully. Now, human intelligence are focusing on writing the right prompt or writing the edit or creating the real creative stuff. Similarly, from the NLP, NLP perspective, when Ian and I were starting working on NLP, we have to build a lot of the foundational things probably you have never heard about anymore. Part of speech tagging, parsing, chunking, word segmentation. It's not a thing anymore, right? That bar has been lifted up. Now you're really focusing on what's the core. Language is really complex. Language is the media for human intelligence. So to answer, I think to follow up on the panelist's suggestion, you should really focus on what is the core of your intelligence is valuable to the job or to the future trend. So to answer this question, I interviewed candidates who have been working on summarization. They have been really focused on the traditional summarization technique. They gave me like full paradigms of summarization, but like I don't need them anymore. It's everything's changing. So if you think about for your job. What is your value to this industry or to a company, even the trend that is moving forward so fast? Really focus on the core. And again, you know, to um, following uh, Xin Tai's point, if you feel that the writing the prompt is the new skill that you need, at the same time, you need to understand the foundation, right? How is ChatGPT working so that you know what to write the right prompt so that the system works? So it's a balance. I think really understand the foundation, understand the core. And then tapping up on what is trending that will give you this high leverage so that when you go to the job interview, you can really answer the question very well and you can let your employer, future employer understand you're going to bring in the tremendous value to the new business model. So it's a balance. Uh, it's not, I don't think there is a simple answer as what you can do to get on to get a job in this competitive market, but really balancing between the short term value and the long-term value. Um, make sure that you're prepared. So one concrete example is when I was at a Facebook, I was doing the machine learning system design interview, probably for 100, 200. Uh, we even give out t-shirts and it says, I interviewed 200 uh, people and all I get is a t-shirt. I'm very proud and very nice t-shirt. So most of the candidates who failed the system design interview, including machine learning, are unfortunately fresh graduates. Does you read and understand everything from the textbook or from famous professor like Ian, but you just don't have the hands-on experience in particular in that kind of processing. So three questions after I started, I can quickly tell that unfortunately the candidate just can't handle this, this complexity, right? It doesn't have the hands-on experiences. That's why it's open source or getting some of intern project, close project will help you to be more prepared in the job interview. Very good. Question. Yeah, I think I agree with Dr. Sang uh, and also Chi. Uh, so I think uh, this is just a hype, I feel like at least the chat GBD, we don't know like uh, what's going to happen maybe down the five year or 10 year, right? So really like uh, curious to see what's going to happen. 
so I think this question is more focusing on what students need to do now. And I mean, there's no right answer here. Uh, but I guess like since I do some interviews for my company, uh, what I have seen from what people do, uh, definitely I think coding is one important skill which you need. Uh, I, I don't know, like machine learning is important, but to be a good machine learning practitioner, uh, I have seen, uh, most, most likely I have seen with like people who come with like a strong research background. Uh, so they don't, they're not good with coding. Uh, so they're not able to write like a, write a simple lead code or a sorting question. Uh, so I think coding is one important skill which you need, uh, learn basic Python or Java or whatever it is. Uh, that's one. And also going back to the ChatGPT trend, right? Uh, try to understand what build ChatGPT, right? So transformers, uh, self-attention. So try to learn that. Uh, try to understand what could be the next major breakthrough which could create new ChatGPTs. Uh, so I think that'll be the another important thing with students. I think you have all the time, like uh, trying to explore different breadth-wise concepts. So uh, so breadth wise is important. Try to understand in computer vision what's going to happen, like stable diffusion or whatever. Uh, in speech, what is happening, and in NLP, what's happening. So do the breadth wise, and then try to focus or specialize in uh, one of your interesting domains. I think that's an important thing uh, I would do if I was in your uh, like time. Uh, I was not able to do when I was a master's student, but now I think this is this is a good direction to think about. So we'll jump over to the next question. So question number three from our students. What can students do now and through their careers to activate and grow their professional networks in Silicon Valley? Get on your favorite uh, professional network, um, like working network, and actually try and follow people whose uh, work you would want to take further or whose work you sort of relate to. That I found really helpful because people often post about uh, openings in these different channels and you can actually identify specific teams rather than like general applications. That's one thing. The other thing that I found really helpful was attending conferences or events like this. Um, so any conference would have a reception and a banquet where you actually can meet a lot of people from different places who can, who, when you have that personal interaction, can then, you know, identify you with the, or like, just, just help you in different ways. Um, they also have these affinity groups now within conferences, which gives you a smaller, more personal space to go interact with people and build your networks. I think these would, in general, like help you build your network further and identify places you really want to be in. Next step. Just to add on that, so I think um, internship is really important here. So I think you know, everyone spends significant amount of time preparing and applying for internship. Um, that is one of the best way that you can get access to you know what is really people are doing uh, in industry in terms of building this latest AI technology. Uh, in addition to that, um, as our panelists discussed, right, so a lot of the recent stuff are coming out on social network like Twitter. Um, follow a few people that are leading the industry trends. Just name a few and you can see and your own stuff. So just follow them. And you know, you can also come in and have a conversation uh, on the thread whenever there's opportunity. Um, there's also a good way to you know, follow the latest trends and get yourself to the people uh, leading this industry. Um, last but not least, right? So um, there are also different interest groups uh, on the internet. Uh, for example, you know, events like this, um, always get access to these different opportunities. And also access to your uh, colleagues, uh, your alumni community. Those can be a great help uh, in terms of broadening your network uh, the industry. Oh, I was just uh, one more thing. Um, uh, even when I was as a faculty member, I was trying to get into all these conference committees, right? It's like powerful job in, in your academia job uh, work. To get started is really hard because they're already well established in that work. So usually the TFA is started by some doing volunteer work as the webmaster. By the time there's a concept called webmaster, create the conference website, starting by all the things small. So if you want to be joining the club, right, this established club, starting with something like volunteer to the conferences or the panel discussion, make yourself be inside. Once you are inside, you'll be able to get more exposure to the 
to the network. Uh, think about this as an investment. You have to invest your time, invest your, your energy, um, and then the outcome would be once you'll be part of that club, you will be getting more resources, more exposure, more connections to your help your career down the road. So don't be afraid to invest and volunteer your time. Think about this as an investment. We've got limited time, so we might jump over to the next question. This one's very important as well. Um, so for the panelists, what do you think a career path in AI or NLP looks like in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, and what skills are essential uh, at that time scale? Yeah, when, when I was uh, looking at this question, I found it is very interesting. Like um, in after like ten or twenty years, think about like what it will be look like. Um, for all the, all of the AI models we're looking at is being AI uh, is being data driven, right? So, like the data format can be totally different back at, uh, after then. Like right now, we're working on the text, and we have a lot of powerful encoder to make a different like, like roughly like a five tail dimension or like a ten twenty four dimension encodings and. It can do like a layer by layer transform by transformers. So um, looking at afterward, we what, what we can encode, we can probably encode the the um, the smell or like the taste. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, if we, and, and like right now, um, one of my friend is working on like um, HCI project and he's kind of like encoding the touch, like the sense of touch, which is very interesting. Like. So the, the thing is, we, we're working on the um, uh, a, a specialization that is able to encode a very complex data, like text. But afterward, we don't know what kind of data we're actually looking at. So, um, so what we can do right now is you know, just keep uh, reading, um, or reading papers to know like what we're sort of want to extract the features from data and to know about like what data we're going to be addressed. So um, keep looking at what kind of open source data or what people are collecting as the project. So that would be, I believe that would be like when when there there's the like some kind of interesting input output comes up, and probably the whole like um, changing will be changed. Um, like right now, like a pretending pretending task, we have self-supervised data. They make masking on that. That would be a change of the whole industry. People start start pretending the models. So um, to formulate this task is very important as well. So can just look at the ar architect, uh, look at the article to see people how people have some kind of like uh, innovative idea on formulating this kind of training task and. Collect the data. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, to add on to that, like, I feel like multimodal systems is going to be really, really interesting. Um, combining like audio data and visual data and natural language data and making it like a cohesive, strong model. Uh, I think that would be extremely, extremely important. Uh, so, what that means in terms of like skills and understanding that you probably need. Um, you probably need an understanding of both, right? Like you need to understand audio data and how that might influence natural language data um, or visual data and how that, you know, connects with natural language data. And I think like, yeah, I mean, that'd be really, really important in the next 10, 20 years. And eventually we'll have robots that have brains that can think, hopefully. Um, but yeah, that that's um, what I would see at least. Okay, if I can add something, because I think I'm not sure how to raise my hand through the Zoom panel, but what does a career path look in 10 to 20 years? I would say it's super hard to predict. I mean, just judging by myself, right? I first started as professor at USC, and I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do. I'm super passionate. I love teaching. I love writing grants, um, doing stellar research. But over time, you see that industry has tons of data and compute. So I shifted from being a professor to industry. 
country where I started um, leading different groups, right? I love search at Yahoo, but uh, then there was something more appetizing like AWS Cloud Compute and how they build deep learning applications for uh, all kinds of customers, right? And that was super nice. And I ride that wave. Um, I hope through Google um, doing search, then uh, Facebook AI doing large language models and all the way now fast forward um, to having my own company. So I think it's super hard to predict where your path will end up. And I think there'll be so many different paths. Some of you will go to PhD, some of you will jump in industry, some of you will maybe even directly go and do your startup right away. But I would say the most important skill is like, like learn how to learn. Because if you can learn and you're learning the whole time, then you're not going to have any roadblock. You can adapt and you can do and go wherever you want. Um, and back to these previous questions of like, how do I prepare? It's okay. You can go interview. If it doesn't happen the first time, don't get discouraged. Keep working on, on your mission, on your goal and try again, right? But I say the most essential skill that will keep you alive and at the peak of innovation is learning, um, have friends, because if I pick a random person in the audience and I ask how many people know this person, how many people know what they're doing, uh, maybe not everyone knows everyone, but you should do it because one of our students at USC is actually the author of Transformers, Ashish, and you should build network with everyone, the people around you, your colleagues, the panelists, anyone you see, so don't be picky. Uh, learn and network and just have fun and uh, adjust and adapt as you go along. The last question from our students and then we'll open up to other questions. So question number five, uh, a lot of students today are preparing for interviews, for internships and then full-time jobs. So as a panelist, uh, can you provide some insight of how our students and professionals can best prepare for interviews, uh, for jobs and internships in the AI in open area? Um, Anyway, um, I would say like it, there's lots of stages, right? Like your resume, the the technical part, the you know culture fit part. In each part, you know you want to understand your weaknesses. Uh, so if your weakness might be new code, then prioritize that, right? Uh, which is maybe more of the technical part. Um, if you feel like uh, maybe it's the resume and portraying yourself in the best possible way then portray that and build the, you know, experience around that area. Um, and, you know, just identifying what your weakness is and focusing on that and then taking a holistic look at what, you know, uh, you're communicating to potential employers uh, is, is, I think, probably the way I would prepare, um, the way I do prepare. Um, so for me, it was like lead code. I don't, um, you know, I'm not terribly good at, um, so for me, that was my weakness, um, and I built on that by like you know preparing and uh, practicing online. So yeah, so I have a, a add on on that. So I find your, I, I do believe like find your connections between the company you're interviewing and you is really important. Sometimes like um, sometimes like people may not entirely working on a project that is pretty relevant to the company you're applying, the job position you're applying, but like um, go survey on like what that company is doing as a project and like, what their AI or is doing. They are not like when you apply for it, it's not possibly like you assign you to the such team that the interviewer is at. So um, they will take a look on what your interesting is, but if it is not very relevant, it can possibly like make you a strong candidate. So find the connection between the company you're interviewing and you, um, despite your project may have a little bit like relevancy, you can just like talk about it and then um, express your influence to, to them like make them know that you're very excited about the project you're gonna work out when you got admitted into the company. That's how I get into the zoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think while uh, talking about interviews, I think it all, I think I, I can start from the beginning. Uh, so, how to build a good profile, right? Like, so that, it always starts with that. But I think LinkedIn is a great tool for that. So, I mean, if you're trying for internship like next summer, 
So I'll start like warrior back, like just try to build your connections because it takes a lot of time to get that relevant people in your profile, right? So always start with like hiring managers, recruiters, uh, and build your connections. So it's nothing wrong. I think mostly LinkedIn people accepts uh, connections. So that's a, that's a good thing. Start with LinkedIn. And one, one important thing here is like, try, don't hesitate to send uh, call messaging. Uh, so people think, right? You send a message, they see, and they ignore it sometimes. But if you keep on doing that, like I think three or four times, uh, if I see like a candidate is messaging me like three or four times, okay, then I will at least like try to respond at least like one word or at least like something relevant. Uh, so that's very important, call messaging in forward LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, preparation wise, definitely coding as I was telling before. And the good, good thing with machine learning interview is that there is still, there doesn't exist like a template. If you prepare this, you will get through or if you're good, right? Uh, for I think generally for software engineering roles, you have like you do lead code, you do like system design, how to design Twitter or how to design Facebook or some questions like that. Uh, so you're mostly through if you're able to do good. But for machine learning interviews, it's like very open ended, uh, which is good actually. So the thing is that if I ask a candidate like 10 questions, I don't expect like the candidate to answer all 10 questions very well. Uh, so maybe doing good in like three or four questions very well. Uh, that might increase your chance. So that is a good thing. Uh, good, good or bad, but it might be good, like if you prepare well. And uh, one more important thing, since we are not that much of time, we can talk more. Uh, don't uh, don't even like uh, tell like let down if you don't clear the first round of uh, any internship or anything. Uh, because uh, what I've seen is like first round is mostly like a like a single point of failure. I'll tell you. Uh, and people will think. Uh, like, okay, I'm not even qualified to clear the first round. But if it's not like that, because first round is like, it's like a large filter you think of. And once you clear the first round, then you get the four or five rounds for the interviews. So failing the first round is not a big deal. It's just a luck. Okay, I'll tell you, it's just a luck. So just like focus on the next interview. So don't uh, be let down if you don't clear the first round. Keep applying. Keep applying to like 10 or more companies. Uh, so that increase your chance. Yeah, I think we can discuss more if you're interested further. Uh, just to add on, uh, in terms of machine learning interviews, uh, I think a project experience really matters here uh, for you to better prepare for that. Um, because once you enter industry, you will see that uh, machine learning algorithms only play a small part for the end to end machine learning system. And that is what we really see during interviews uh, in terms of the gap from uh, junior engineers versus senior engineers. Um, the project experience where you know start from problem formulations, start and then followed by how you really collect the data, clean the data, how you do feature engineering, how you build model out of that, and later how you're gonna deploy that at our cloud and on device. And last but not least, how to monitor a service. This entire cycle um, that we developed, you know, project experience really, really matters on uh, your machine learning interviews. So I want to highly recommend um get through the Leverage on your project experience. Uh, don't focus entirely only on machine learning algorithms. There are much more bigger space than uh, the focus groups. Yeah, probably just a plus one on that. Um, if you think about what machine learning is practiced in industry, I would say 99% of the heavy lifting part is not on the algorithm. Nobody writes a new framework anymore at the, in, in any company. Nobody's really looking at another optimization method anymore. It's all from, from open source, from publications. As I've been said, when I'm the hiring manager, I'm looking for the team members, the candidates who can really have a great understanding of how to frame the business problem into the right machine learning problem. Right? Should we treat this as a regression problem or classification problem? If it's a classification, how would you define it? Are we going to make this as a binary classification or multi class classification? Right? Um, data cleaning, or what about the missing data? How you can do the feature engineering? All these things can only be built from your experiences. To add on to the point, I would say a successful interview or to successfully land on the job, 95% of the work should have been done before the interview. In your class training, your course project, in your other time of work, you should have a good understanding of natural language processing foundation, good understanding of machine learning, you should have all the experiences in um, training machine learning model end to end. 
but you do need a 5% or 10% of the effort to sharpen up your interview process. You need to have a clear explanation or storytelling of the project you did. Try this at home with your roommates or your significant others. If, in particular, if they're not in your field, in the journey or NLP, make sure they can understand clearly what you're talking about. This is something I learned from my own career. Right? When I graduated from CMU, I was in the job market. I would assume by the time everybody understands machine learning, right? So popular, so hot. So surprising thing is in Silicon Valley, I would say 80% of the time when I talk to people about machine learning, people don't know what I'm talking about. So try to have a clear, understandable way to explain the project you work on to sell your value. Treat this as in sales process. You spend 95% of time at school or doing a project to build up the product, but you still need this 5% of effort to sell the product. Understand your audience, use language you understand, and sell the value that they care about. Right? If you are building a great, awesome model, people are like, I don't care. Right? What's the business value? Try to make sure that it's clear to them. And don't oversell yourself. Right? If we have a fresh graduate from college saying they're just trained this as good as strategy GBT model, like, eh, I, I don't believe it. It's, I can't even do it. Uh, if you can do everything, it's probably too good to be true. So coming up with a realistic package that you will make sure that they understand your value and try to see you as a team member that fit in your team, that fit in your business. So we might wrap up those questions here. We've got more time with our panelists. Yeah, after the panel session, we can chat with them, small group setting. But we'll, we'll spend a, a couple of minutes taking any additional questions from uh, students here today. Do we have any students from the uh, any questions from the audience? We have the microphone. Yeah, I have a question. So I guess this is directed all of you really so why did you choose ai like what did you see back then i mean right now it's really hyped up you know everyone's talking about it but i'm sure when you started it wasn't like that popular with people. so why did you choose the field and why did you choose to pursue it i, I can i can do that um when i was in, uh, doing my undergrad um i was just doing computer science um and i was doing like front-end development so like with React and Vue.js, and I was doing math for my minor, and that was a lot of fun. I really felt like that kind of resonated with me. Um, and when I saw NLP, it was sort of like going be, uh, going under the hood and seeing like the math behind it, you know, the linear combinations that you do, defining the linear subspaces and everything like that. It sort of resonated with me really well. And um, just being honest, I really didn't like low-level programming, so like programming in C or any of that stuff. Um, so it was a blessing that it was, um, you know, most of the AI is written in, in Python. So having that as well as like sort of the mathematical component of it and the theoretical component of it was very, very like aligned with me. So um, that's kind of how I started my process. Not so much the linguistic side of things, but I developed an appreciation for that later on when I started to realize, hey, actually, this is pretty mathematical. Uh, so for me, it was more theoretical component that really grabbed me. This brings up a very great point. Um, so just to answer directly, I love languages and I love math. And I found this was the way I could combine the two to work uh, on both. But I think this actually answers a bigger question of what area to choose. There might be some application fees that you're really passionate about. It could be health, it could be biophysics, it could be a wide variety of things. And with, when you try to find solutions to specific problems in there, maybe it will lead you to this um, to this very specific area of AI that you can then expand on. I think we are at a point where it's uh, evolving so fast, like AI applications. I think now it's maybe the best time to do this. Like find the space that you are interested in. Hi everyone, I'm Meghna and I'm a master's in artificial intelligence student from the San Jose State University. So my question is that uh, there are so many fields in artificial intelligence, like there's convolutional networks going on and then there's stable diffusion and NLP. 
So what do you suggest? Should we like go for just one particular field and build ourselves and uh, get to you know, you know that field perfectly or we should have experience in all of them and then go for as many jobs or internships as possible. Um, yeah, I think I'll continue from where I left. Uh, so it depends on what what you want. Like if you're looking for a job, right? right? So then uh, stick with the basics. Uh, respect your field, whether it's computer vision or uh, NLP or whatever. Uh, learn the basics uh, because that is one important thing I think covered in the interviews or can help you in future. Uh, so how does like a perceptron or uh, what are the optimization techniques? What is gradient design and so learn the basics and to answer further, you're asking like why, which area one should focus. And I think that answer is like, what you really like, right? Because Sunipa was telling she loved languages, right? So I think that is one thing. One, one thing which really like uh, interests me is like NLP. Why I chose NLP was the reason, because I come from media, there are a lot of different languages. And one day I wanted to like maybe find a way whether like we can support like the law resource languages because you know right all the chat GPT all the fancy models right because it has a lot of training data that's why it's performing very well but for the law resource languages uh, it's not the case because we don't have enough, enough transcription and enough data to train so try to find your passion and uh, that way you can choose what you really want. We might take a question from Santa Cruz. I, I had a question. So uh, you guys mentioned that uh, right now uh, it isn't just about I don't know, the algorithms or uh, optimization. That since these uh, these things are like done by other people, and uh, you don't have to like focus on that that much. So my question is that uh, is it worth it to learn like uh, and uh, uh, as you guys said that for example you have to send your idea, for example, know how to uh, make something work, for example, how to use this, I don't know, like technology, new feature, whatever, you use it in the product. So my question is that, uh, do we need to like learn how to use, I don't know, some software products or something to like make the ML application part with them? Or is it better to just focus on the uh, ML part, like machine learning part? So for example, I don't know, like some services, yeah, other techniques uh, other than machine learning. If, you think, if I think back, all the courses I learned when I was in college doing the bachelor's, I think those are still very valuable, right? Data structure, compiler, assembly languages, probably don't take that anymore. Do I use assembly at all? <laughs> Never after I finished my bachelor's, and uh, it's now hidden way behind even compiler. I don't even do compiler anymore. But having a good understanding of how the underlying system works helps me to design and build a system on top, right? So my, I would say my focus, my intelligence is really way off the ladder now, focusing on the things that is up in the ladder. But without understanding all the foundations, I would not even create a system that will scale and robustly without understanding the foundation. Um, I think that's sort of my true feeling of why I still feel all the courses I take in undergraduate are super valuable to me, even though I forgot 99%. Yeah, so uh, just to add on what I mentioned, okay? so uh, I think uh, you really need to have a thinking in terms of the foundation and verticals. Right, so those are the things that change and don't change. Uh, foundations, uh, what doesn't change is machine learning foundations. What doesn't change is the strong software engineering skills. Those are going to be the key part in whatever areas that you're going to work on in machine learning uh, industry. Uh, for the verticals, um, there are many different applications. Right? So in terms of business applications, they don't change all the time. Right? So the problem space that are there all the time. Insurance, finance, healthcare, just name a few. Right? So those don't change. Uh, what change time to time is the technique, the solution uh, for us to solve the problems. And uh, those are the areas that we see day to day. Right? So a few years ago, that is reinforcement learning after AlphaGo. Two years ago, like Joy mentioned, is you know, generative adversarial network. 
let's say it's a mathematical model. And those are gonna continue to evolve. New technology, new name gonna continue to evolve. Um, don't feel formal. Uh, so as long as you have a good machine learning foundation and a strong engineering skills and have a good understanding of one particular vertical on business, uh, it will be in good shape. Okay, thank you all. Let's thank our panelists. We're going to wrap up here.